and welcome to the Word of Truth, the Sunday School Class of the Air with your teacher, Rod Payne. The Word of Truth. Hello and welcome to the second Sunday in the month of September. Again, depending on when you're watching the program, you could be watching the program a few days before the second Sunday, September the 8th, or you could be watching a few days after September the 8th. But this is the program related to the study for September the 8th here on the Word of Truth as we continue our study in the book of Acts. And as I said last week, we're in the second half of the book of Acts. So last week we began with chapter 13, the first 13 verses of that chapter. This week we'll be at the last part of that chapter, beginning with verse 42 in chapter 13, as we continue to look at the wonderful way that God is spreading His Word. Beginning, yes, we were talking about Jerusalem primarily before, but now we start and we're centered in Antioch and moving on to the island of Cyprus and Paul's missionary journey is going on because God is directing it. But before we get into today's time together of study, I want to say a very happy birthday to any of you who are celebrating birthdays around this second weekend in the month of September. If you're celebrating an anniversary, likewise, happy anniversary to you. If you're remembering someone that you lost around this time in this month or in this month, you know, years ago or whatever, please remember my constant, my overarching prayer is that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I pray that your loved one is experiencing Him in person now in heaven in glory. And I also pray that you will know a great and glorious reunion one day with those who've gone on before us. I'd also like to say personally, thank you again for your many, many prayers. Thank you so much on behalf of not only myself, but Vicki and our little granddaughter and our rest of our family as well, thank you so very, very much for your prayers. They're felt. We know that you're praying and we appreciate it so much. While we're on the subject of prayer, I and the rest of the team would like to pray for you. If you'd like to, you may write to us at the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street. There's the address on the screen. The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. And the zip code is 76301. That address again is the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and the zip code is 76301. If on the other hand, you'd like to make your request more immediate, you may call us during normal business hours, Monday through Thursday, and again on Friday morning at 940-723-2764. Again, that number, area code 940, then 723-2764. Ask, please, for my office, Rod Payne, or ask for the Missions and Media Office. If someone can't answer the phone right then, if 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 we've stepped away from our desks, or if we're out in the hall doing something, or we're over here in the worship center doing something, please leave us a voicemail. We want to return your call. We want to pray for you, or for someone for whom you care, or about a situation or a circumstance. So please let us know how we can pray for you, or... Let us know that you're praying for this team that puts together this program every week. Well, as I mentioned, we find ourselves now in the last part of chapter 13. And again, I want to refer this week to this wonderful volume that, again, I purchased while a student at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary now 37-something years ago. I uh, have completed 37 years here at First Baptist Church uh, back in July, August. And uh, it's been a wonderful time, continues to be a wonderful time. God continues to just bless the ministry here. And I'm just blessed to be a part of all the things that God has going on here. But when I was a student at Southwestern, I purchased this book. And it's a wonderful Bible study. And it's a wonderful, really historical narrative study about God's Word. And it talks today about um, what we're going to hear in today's passage As Paul proclaims the good news, and I said last week when closing last week's program, this week he's proclaiming it to someone, to a group of people who, honestly, they weren't first in line. But because the first in line rejected it, then didn't want to hear it, basically, many of them. Now, there there were a lot of Jewish converts. I don't want to say all Jewish people, you know, rejected the word of God. That's not true. Saul himself. Uh, an ardent follower of Judaism and a a persecutor of those who had become Christians. But he becomes a believer in Jesus when Jesus confronts him. 
But many of the leadership, most of the leadership, and a lot of the rank and file said, no, no, we're still waiting. In fact, to this day, there are a lot of folks who are Israeli or Jewish descent who say, no, you guys are following a false Messiah. We're waiting on the true Messiah. What more did he need, did he need to do? Okay, what more did Jesus need to do during his time here? This wonderful book I was citing earlier says, although Peter had proclaimed the resurrection and, and the forgiveness of sins through Christ, and we see that in earlier passages in Acts, not until this time, the passage we're going to be looking at today, had anyone preached so explicitly that men could be justified individually before God. So it wasn't a collective nationalism. It wasn't a, as the nation of Israel knew, well, we're, we're, we're God's chosen people. No, this was individual. The author says individually before God on the sole ground of their faith. Okay. Didn't have anything to do with their nationality. Didn't have anything to do with their lineage, their heritage. It has everything to do. Your, your salvation, mine, are personal. Okay. Jesus died once and for all for forgiveness of sins. That's true. But as I mentioned last week, when we were talking about that false prophet, that, that perverter of God's word, he did not die in a form of universalistic salvation. Okay. It didn't happen. That's not the way God's word presents it. We can't say that. Oh, that we could. Oh, that we could. So that all the folks before who lived and sometimes lived exemplary lives, sometimes lived uh, lives that brought great entertainment, for instance, to countless, maybe millions. Or sometimes uh, they did uh, tremendous works for their fellow man. It's wood, hay, and stubble. I hate to say it. I'm not the one that makes that decision. I'm not the arbiter and the, the, the final judge. But the word describes it as wood, hay, and stubble, and it burns up in the fire. Yeah, yeah. All those great accomplishments, all those great feats, the pyramids, uh, amazing marvels of engineering, uh, uh, incredible scientific accum, uh, incredible uh, discoveries, supposedly discoveries. They weren't discoveries for God. He already knew all this stuff. But all these things, no, no, they're for naught if a person doesn't have a relationship, personal relationship, by the way, with Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 13, begin with verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving a synagogue where they were teaching, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. The people are saying, we want to hear more. As we're going to learn, as we continue to read this passage, those who are in charge are becoming very, very jealous. They don't want them to continue to express God's love through the gift of Jesus Christ and the grace and salvation that he offers. They don't want that because they believe themselves to have a corner on the market for making sure that people toe the line according to them, according to them, not according to this word, but they've added so much to this word. And the word says you'll neither add to nor take away from it. We know about entire religious sects that have done the same thing. All you need to do is look at the Book of Mormon. Don't look any further than what they call their four works. The King James Version of the Bible, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, and the Book of Mormon, you've got three volumes. There are three works that were added to the Word of God. And by the way, there uh, have been many far, I'm not a student at all, but there have been some great students of the Book of Mormon. They'll show you chapter and verse lifted verbatim from the Old Testament and somehow or another translated as though it had something to do with something in North America which it didn't, which there's never been any evidence at all of any form of any of the things that Joseph Smith said took, took place on the North American continent. None. If there was, they'd be trumpeting that from uh, not only from the Temple Square and Salt Lake, they'd be trumpeting it in every major magazine and periodical and website around the world. But there's not. You don't add to, you don't take away from. But the Jewish people in charge had made their own rules and regs. And they had said, everybody's got to toe this line. If you don't, you've messed up. Now, I'll grant you, there are ten commandments given to us by God, brought down from the mountain, not once, but twice. 
Yeah, there are Ten Commandments. And Moses was told by God to etch them in stones, or Moses receives rather the tablets etched with the Ten Commandments on them, and he takes them down. And we know these things. But it's by grace we're saved, not of works. So none of us can boast in our, in our salvation because we've done nothing to attain it. None of the good works. The Word of God says, in fact, describing my good works, it says my works, my, my good stuff is like filthy rags. And there's a, it actually uses a, a worse term, but in English, we can get away with filthy rags. The people want to know more. Verse 43, when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the, what is this word in the NIV translation? In the grace of God. They weren't saying to them, continue on in the rules and regulations, continue on in the hierarchical structure, continue on in the uh, dot your I's and cross your T's. No. They urge them to continue in the grace of God. Buddy, Christ, if we're not careful, we still do the same thing today. We say, well, you don't know know the right verbiage. You don't say the right things. You don't know churchies. Or you don't dress in the correct fashion. Or you come to God's house, and I loved seeing that movie. Uh, Now it's been some time ago. It had to have been some time ago. When you have a baby, you don't go to the movies. I didn't go to the movies that much anyway before we had the baby, but uh, now that we're raising our granddaughter, you don't go to the movies. But I loved seeing the movie Jesus Revolution because I knew some of the participants. I had met some of them personally. And I loved seeing that movie because I remember getting saved during that time, not in that location. But the man that led both G- uh, Vicky and I to Jesus later on became the pastor of prayer for Pastor Chuck at Calvary Chapel. Yes, they had a pastor of prayer. Remarkable. That's my, my understanding. If I remember right, that was, his, that was Ray's title. And he led both Vicky and I to Christ. I can remember what was going on during those days. And I can remember getting those first records that we called Jesus People records. But one of the things that I carry with me as one of my fondest memories is the fact that when I started going to church, and I'd gone to church as a kid, then... Like so many had left the church and then came back and started going to church again. And I, believe it or not, this was before uh, my college days, believe it or not, I had some fairly long hair. Yeah, there's pictures somewhere. I had some pretty long hair and I did not look like your normal Sunday go-to-meet in person. But I was made to feel welcome by Ray and by a number of other folks. In Mountain California, Pastor Chuck Smith's church, there were people who said, no, we don't want to have anything to do with these folks because they're hippies. If you remember that terminology from the late 60s, early 70s, they're hippies. And then they don't look anything like us and they don't, they, don't, they don't act like us and they don't worship God like us and they can't be right. If you've not seen that movie and if you have the opportunity to see the movie, see it. We saw it in a real theater, and there were people shouting for joy and just saying hallelujah. I mean, it was like a revival in a movie theater. But if you remember the story, Pastor Chuck said, we gave you the gospel. The, the, the folks who knew all the churches and knew all the right things to say and behaved in the right fashion and dressed appropriately, we gave you the gospel, but you didn't celebrate it. And these young people are celebrating because they know in whom they have believed. And they are persuaded that he is able to keep that which they've committed unto him against that day. They know from which they've been freed. They've been freed by Jesus. And they know from what they've been freed. On the next Sabbath, verse 44, almost the whole city, body of Christ, when you see a movement of God, When you see a true active movement of God, you don't have to have advertising. You don't have to have good PR skills. You don't have to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, billboards or radio ads or television. When you see it, and I'm not decrying any of that stuff because, praise God, that's how I get an opportunity to uh, be involved in ministry often. But when you see a mighty movement of God in a place, people turn out because they want to know. They know there's something missing. And they want to know what it is and how do they get it in their lives. On the next Sabbath, 
Verse 44, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, verse 45, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. In Pastor Chuck's church, there were stalwart, great folks. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about them. They were great folks and probably had been uh, pillars of the church forever. But they didn't want to have anything to do with these new, they didn't know all the right phrases and they didn't express themselves in the quiet, demure fashion and they dressed like they dressed and their hair was down, you know, even the guys, you know. And the pillars, the members that had been there for so long, many of them said, I don't want to have anything to do with these folks. How would we translate that today in the year 2024? I would say addiction. I would say if the church has one last great mission field that you don't even have to go overseas to be a part of, that you don't even have to spend the night away from your own home each night to be involved in, it would be addiction and recovery and the poor and the lives of so many who are broken because of alcoholism or drug addiction or a combination thereof or sex trafficking, or whatever you want to say. But there are people today right here in North Texas who are living lives of not quiet desperation, of great sorrow because they do not have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've not trusted Him. No, it's not going to cure all their ills. It's not going to give them Harvard MBAs and put them up in a nice residence and provide for them a wonderful income. But it's going to do something far greater than all of those things. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the soul. That makes me white as as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what so many in this generation need to hear. And they're living lives of not quiet again, but desperate sorrow. We have them in every aspect of life, from the upper echelons of government to the very, very streets and sidewalks of our own community. These folks came, but the Jews were jealous. In other words, the established church said, we don't want to have anything to do with these addicts. We don't have anything to do with these alcoholics. We don't have anything to do with these uh, folks of the street. We have our prim. We have our proper. We've dotted our I's and we've crossed our T's. And that's what we want. Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. They came. They, what was their practice? They always went to the synagogues first. That's where the Jewish people met. That's where they congregated. We came to you first. We brought this good news to you. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. Now, here's where this analogy breaks up. A little. Because the vast majority of folks, myself included, in our pews, have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. But there's more to that. Jesus said, I have come that you might have joy and that abundantly. I've, I've, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Uh, I want to give you my peace, not a peace of this world, but a peace that passes understanding. So many people within the body of Christ don't know that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. They don't know it. They have a resolved, a resigned, uh, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to just somehow or another muddle through. And that's not what's supposed to happen. I heard a wonderful teacher the other day say on television, when someone asks us how we're doing, we're not to say, well, I'm getting by as well as I can under the circumstances. But instead, we're supposed to say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. I need to be doing more of that as God battles this cancer within me. I need to be doing more of that praising of God. Paul said, we we brought the message to you first, but you didn't consider yourself worthy. So now we're turning to the Gentiles. Remember what Jesus said? There's going to be a great feast. He gave this illustration. Then they went out and they invited all the the big wigs, the, the folks that should have come. They invited them to come to the feast. 
But they didn't come. They were busy or they had other things that they wanted to do. So then he said, go out into the highways and the byways. In other words, go out to the streets, go out to the sidewalks, go out underneath the overpasses. I guess you call it an underpass. Go to the AA meetings, go to the NA meetings, go to the Regen meetings. Go and find people who are broken and know they're broken and share the good news with them. Since you rejected it, we turn to the Gentiles. Verse 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you, and he quotes from Isaiah 49, verse 6. Let me just keep your finger right there in Acts. And I'm going to turn over to Isaiah 49, verse 6. This is God speaking to the, to the servant of the Lord. It is, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back the house of Israel I have kept. I also will make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Do you understand what God's word is saying here? Yes, the nation of Israel. Yes, the Jewish people were God's chosen people, but they were supposed to be and are still supposed to be a light to other folks. They were supposed to be bringing the light and saying, just like that wonderful old hymn, there's a call comes ringing over the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. We're supposed to be light in a world full of darkness. Here we are the second weekend in the month of September. We have a national election just a little ways down the road. You know what's been going on and how all these things have changed and turned. And you know what's happening in the world at large with catastrophic weather issues and things of this nature. But we're supposed to be the light. We're not supposed to be the ones furtively, you know, wringing our hands and woe is me. We're supposed to be the ones saying, I know in whom I have believed it and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Right out of the word of God, we're supposed to be claiming it, believing it, and most importantly, living it so that that light might shine. I have guided, I have made you, he quotes right out of Isaiah, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, in other words, when the alcoholics, when the addicts, when the people on the periphery, when the people on the outside, when the people who weren't accepted, when the people who didn't know the right things to say, when they heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. You know, when I have some of my greatest times of worship, I love worshiping here and I love watching our broadcasts and I worship um, various times in the summer, I had various uh, things that were happening uh, from radiation to uh, I contracted COVID uh, near, uh, near the uh, beginning of uh, August and was uh, confined to my home for a little while. And during all those times, I had the wonderful opportunity to watch the broadcast from First Baptist Church. And they just so encouraged my heart. But you know when some of my best times of worship ever happened is when I'm out at All Red Prison. Yeah. When I'm out at the prison with all those guys in white and one or two correctional officers, but the vast majority of them are inmates in that gym. We keep praising God and believing that God's going to help raise the money to build a new chapel out there. But in any respect, when I'm out there, I see people who are passionately, fervently, with abandon worshiping God seeking after him with all their hearts, with everything they have within them. Now, some people would say, well, that's a foxhole conversion, or that's, uh, you know, uh, just because they're in prison. That No, no. There are people who have graduated from programs out there at All Red of, of, a, of a Christian nature who've gone on to do great things with their lives and have gone on to help others. They've seen others struggling and they've extended hands to help their friends, to help others out of the miry pit. Body of Christ, when we're passionate about God, just like these Gentiles, it says here, they were, they were excited. They were glad and honored the word of God. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. What a thing for God to have selected. Now, I know there are a lot of arguments for and against what the Bible says that whom he foreknew, he elected. And how do we how do we get past free will? Well, I don't think this argues with free will. 
Some would argue, and this, there may be some wisdom here, that God knows who's going to choose him in advance. Some would argue that God has chosen certain people for salvation. Others, he's consigned to not know him. We know he changed Pharaoh's mind. God is God. He's sovereign. But how wonderful this word is, that all who were appointed for eternal life believed. There were Gentiles there who weren't dissuaded by the established church, who weren't put off by not knowing the right things to say and not having the right clothing and not right. You know, they weren't put off. They believed. The word of the Lord spread, verse 49, through the whole region. But the Jews inside the God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city, here we go, they served up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet, listen to this, in protest against them and went on. The disciples were filled, listen to this, they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You've heard this expression before, haven't you? Shook the dust off their feet. It was a way of saying, I'm done with you. I tried. I'm not saying that God can't do a greater work or another work in your life later. But as for me and my ministry here, I'm not going to continue to bark up this wrong tree. I'm not going to continue to try to get inside a door that you've locked and firmly shut. In the body of Christ, the Word of God warns us. The Son of Man will not always, He will not always be striving with men. He will not always be, He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will let me in. If he knocks, and you're watching this program today, and maybe he's been knocking, and you know it. If he knocks, let him in. Let him in. Accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Don't let another second go by without believing in Him as the Son of God, confessing that with your mouth, trusting Him with your eternity. As always, we'd love to hear from you. You can write to us at the Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. The zip code is 76301. This address is right there on the screen. The Word of Truth, 1200 Ninth Street, Wichita Falls, Texas. The zip code is 76301. You can call us Monday through Thursday or Friday mornings during normal business hours at 940-723-2764. Again, that number, 940-723-2764. You can call us. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know if we can pray for someone else or tell us that you're praying for us or you're watching the program. We'd be encouraged to hear from you. We'll see you again next week as we continue our study here in the book of Acts here on the Word of Truth. Look forward to seeing you then. Join us, please. You've been watching the Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for the Word of Truth. 